In a recent interview we were able to obtain with Demario Solomon Simmons, who's the lead counsel for the Freedman Band in this recent lawsuit brought up against uh, the Secretary of the Interior, Department of Interior, and Principal Chief James Floyd, he referenced a case previously that he had uh, was able to uh, argue for in the Muscogee Creek Nation District Court in 2003 in which you were the judge on that case. Can you just tell us a little bit about that case that he referenced? Yes, the case involved Ron Graham who had been denied citizenship on his applications that were filed three or four times during the 1990s. His application for citizenship was based on some other laws and ways that you could become a citizen of the Creek Nation that is provided for by the Constitution of the Creek Nation. By the time he filed his lawsuit, those laws had been repealed. However, when I looked at it, I thought that the Citizenship Board administratively should consider what the law was when he filed his application. And that was the end result of the trial that we had, which went over several days. Part of that came from testimony from people in the, that worked and were chairmen and workers in the Citizenship Board of the Creek Nation where they said they didn't consider those old laws because they weren't trained to consider them and of course this was 2003 and those laws that were passed back in the late 1980s were repealed in 2000. So all I did at that time, because I hadn't been ordered to do anything by the Supreme Court, I did have a Supreme Court case on uh, Mrs. Todd that had come down from the Supreme Court after I had ruled in her case and she was being, she was having her citizenship taken away from her after she had already been approved as a citizen. And it's the burden of proof in that, in that case, the Todd case, is on the citizenship board when they've already approved someone. It's not as easy to take away your citizenship as it is to get it in those instances. And in that case, I had remanded it back to the Citizenship Board for them to review the criteria for their ability to remove the case. That case was went to the Supreme Court and I was upheld on that administrative review. This Graham case um, went to the Supreme Court after the Citizenship Board through the Attorney General's office appealed what I had decided at the lower court to go back and have it administratively reviewed. There actually hadn't been any decision of the court other than to send it back and have the administrative body follow the law as I saw it that was in place in the 90s when Ron Graham filed his petition. In the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court sent me down uh, a request for clarification on many items that uh, they weren't at the trial level and I had to look at the trial transcript to determine what those were and sent that back to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had records and transcripts of sworn testimony where the, the uh, chairman of the, the uh, Citizenship Board for the Creek Nation, now we're, after, we're in 2003 after that the law was, these laws that they were relying on were repealed in 2000 and the chairman and the people at the election board stated in court that they were told not, they were told not to pay attention to those rules. Well, <coughs> my thinking on that was you file for stuff under the law as it is when it's, when you file, not when the government changes it later on. <coughs> However, the Supreme Court did not agree with me and they <coughs> ruled that the case be, they ordered me to dismiss the case. That's what happened and that's what I did. So both cases, essentially, if you just go blanket uh, rationalization, are Freedman 
uh, seeking citizenship. But that's sort of where a lot of the similarities end because these are very different in, in certain aspects. Right. The, the Graham case that I handled had to do with the statute and its interpretations. <clears throat> the, the early Creek Nation National Council passed a law that added several different ways you could become a citizen, not just the Dawes Commission. <clears throat> Excuse me. After 2000, the National Council repealed those laws and took them out and went back to what the Constitution says, which you have to be a lineal descendant off of the Dawes Commission rolls. Uh, but as I said, my position was somebody applied for their license under the old law, and if they qualify, they should have their license, for instance, or they should have their citizenship. The Supreme Court asked for clarification, which I've told you about, and then they ruled that the old law didn't apply and sent me an order telling me to dismiss the case. When the Supreme Court sends me an order, I follow their orders, and I dismiss the case. Simple as that. Um, you know, you look at what you've said as far as uh, at the timing of, of the, the case previously that you heard, and just a few years prior, you said laws were repealed. I, I would wonder if, if for the audience that may be watching this interview, um, would would hear that and say, well, that could happen again, possibly. What's that process? I mean, how quickly can that happen to change everything about a way the case is decided? Well, the National Council can change the law anytime they wish. And they could change it back. They can do as they please with the law, assuming it's within their purview and doesn't violate the United States Constitution or some orders of the United States Supreme Court or legislation of the United States Congress. Again, to, just to clarify, the National Council can order Citizenship Board to change citizenship requirements? They would. They can change the way you get, a, get citizenship. Right. In other words, in 1980, they added some other ways to become citizens, mm -hmm. not just off the Dawes Commission rolls. Right. And that's what was not considered with Ron Graham's applications that he filed in the 90s. The ruling was made after the law had been changed and the Citizenship Board did not consider those old laws. I just merely thought that they should consider those old laws and that's what I ruled. And then when it finally got to the Supreme Court, five justices said, the new law is what applies and ordered, sent me an order dismissing the case. So I dismissed it. Another one of the, the big differences, and I think you pointed this out too, is that whereas this new lawsuit really has a lot to do with the Treaty of 1866, the previous one that you heard had nothing to do with the no, treaty. The, the, here, the case that I held, heard on was Graham's case involved a statute. There's a world of difference between a creek statute and a treaty of the United States. And they're poles apart. Treaties are the supreme law of the land. And the only way Indian tribes exist today is because they follow treaties. That's how they get, it, get their rights. If, there's, if the treaties were all thrown out, then everybody can just pack their tent and go home because you won't have any Indian nations left. You know, not to speculate what the outcome of this newest lawsuit would be, but we have seen precedents from other tribes, specifically two very large tribes right in Oklahoma. Can you talk a little bit about what we could maybe learn from those cases that we could almost speculate as to what may happen here or what the possible outcome could be? Well, the Seminole Nation and the Cherokee Nation have had this settled for them by the federal court system based on their treaties with the United States of America after the Civil War. I think there's going to be a lot of study on particularly between the Creek Nation and the Cherokee Nation treaties to see where the differences are. And therein lies the problem for the Indian tribes. Plus, as I mentioned, treaties are very important. They're the, they're the life of these Indian tribes. Without treaties, they don't exist. As governments. Correct, they're just, they evaporate. 
and particularly with respect to the Creek Nation, it's involved in two uh, treaty matters right now, one of them involving a murder case and this other one involving a citizenship. And in one of them, they want to uphold the treaty and the other one they may want to dis up not uphold the treaty and what, where's the winner there? This is, of course, going to the D.C. court. If they rule in favor uh, of the plaintiffs in this case, uh, what does it mean for what happens then at the tribe? Well, number one, nobody knows what the court's going to do in D.C. We do know that they issued an opinion in the Cherokee case. But I'll not speculate on what the judge will do in D.C., and plus that's a district court. From there, they might want to go to the appellate court, or the Second Circuit, which is the mini Supreme Court. So it's not over. It's not over. But it's a different issue than I handled in the case with Ron Graham. Let's just say, for instance, they do rule in favor. What then happens at Creek Nation? I mean, what, what then is the, what is then the move for Muscogee Creek Nation government at that point? Indian tribes are always in jeopardy when they worry, have to have a court make the decision. And it's been my observation in Supreme Court cases involving Indian tribes when they hold against the Indian, Indian tribe, something bad happens along with it. It's always happened. And that's what you have to avoid. Uh, that's all I can say about that. Because the, the big boys in Washington, D.C. make decisions on this stuff. I'm just an old country lawyer. Is it fair to say that it's, you know, citizenship is a very it's proving to be a very complex issue because of all the things that arise and how it's changed and it's been very fluid. Um, you, you know, what makes you a citizen today may not make you a citizen next year. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of see this constantly being a problem until it's, this is what makes you a, a citizen if you have blood lineage or if this is, you know, is this something that will constantly have to reassess, go back and argue? Well, actually, the, the Santa Clara case, federal Supreme Court case, says Indian tribes can determine who their citizens are, period. Uh, yeah. And when, you, when you're down to a Dawes Commission, and I've talked to people about this for years, the Dawes Commission roles were created by federal statute. What happens if they repeal that federal statute? No Dawes Commission roles. No roles. Uh, it doesn't make any difference anyway. So you ought, the Indian tribes need to take their own sovereignty, change their own constitutions where we're organized under our own inherent sovereignty. Then you won't have the federal government coming in and say, you aren't one. You see, the Hawaiians are that way. They don't recognize the federal government. But we've been led around by the nose for so long, the Indian tribes think they've got to do everything the feds tell them, and they don't. It took us a while to get the approval of the Bureau of Indian Affairs out of the Creek Nation Constitution. But that was done about the same time as the Graham case was filed. So the Creek Nation's done a lot of things, but they still have reference to federal statutes in their constitution, which are wrong. Uh, there's things in the constitution that were put in there by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which the judge in Washington, D.C. said for them not to put in there, but they went ahead and put them in there anyway. The 1866 and 67 constitution is better than the one we got today, but they didn't want to do it because it's much easier to control a small body rather than a bigger body.